And I think we're a little crowded this morning, so we won't do that. But Wayne, oh, you like those. You like those kinds? You want to get up and move for a moment? Get up and move. Say hello to someone you haven't said hello to this morning. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Y'all are getting used to this. Okay. Okay, now you can sit down. I think y'all like that part of the morning service. Okay, do we have first time visitors this morning? Anyone who has not been with us before? Well, good morning. How are you this morning? Please introduce yourself. Steve and Jesse, Steve and Carol. So nice to have you this morning. Any other visitors? Well, we're so glad all of you are with us. Remember, we are going to be here for the next three Sundays. And just a, a preview of what those Sundays will entail. Next Sunday, we will have communion. We also are going to be blessed to have the baptism of four of our folks. That is an amazing, amazing thing. God is just doing wonderful works. And we are, will just rejoice next week as our four people are being baptized to declare their dedication to the Lord. And the week after that will be the 12th. It is the first day of daylight savings time. You are going to lose an hour. So if you show up here at what you think is 9 o'clock, you will have already missed the service. So please come early that morning. We also are going to have a speaker on the 12th uh, from Kids Path to tell us about that program to homeless children. And then the week after that, we don't know what's going to happen, but We'll have a good time. Uh, and then the last Sunday of March, we will be back at Swiss. Okay? And on that Sunday, we are going to have a renewal of vows. If you would like to renew the vows that you made, back, if you can even remember them, please see one of the pastors. We would love to have you participate in that renewal of vows. Okay? Are there any other announcements? Yes. Okay. Beverly would like to speak to us for a moment. Everyone knows that I ask you to pray for my daughter, Melissa. She's had cancer before, and we were very nervous about this. She finally got her ultrasound. Thank the good Lord for all your prayers. It came back no change. She's going to be okay for now. Thank you. Don't we love those kinds of news? Okay, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being here this morning among your people. We thank you for this community of believers that uphold each other in prayer, that reach out helping hands in need, friends who rejoice with us, cry with us, and pray with us. 
We do thank you, Father, for all of that and what it means to our lives. And we thank you for the opportunity to serve you here in this community. We thank you for the listing of all the things that the Lord's Church did in 2022. And we ask, Father, that you guide us in this year. Open our eyes to even more ways to serve you and to serve those around us. And now, Father, we give you this service. We ask you to be with Pastor Roy as he brings the message, with Lewis as he brings music, with uh, Greg as he brings song, and that in everything we do and say here the Father, this morning, it will be bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. he has done. Thanks, Lewis. Please join me in the call to worship. We come to you, O oh God, to thank you for what is good. We come to you, O oh God, to cry out for what is wrong. We come to you, O oh God, to ask for help and restoration. We come to you, O oh God, with aching hearts and glad souls. Let us worship God. Amen. And forever. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, from you comes every good and perfect gift. We give you praise and thanks for all your mercies. Your goodness has created us. Your bounty has sustained us. Your discipline has chastened us. And your patience has borne with us. Your love has redeemed us. Give us a heart to love and serve you and enable us to show our thankfulness for all your goodness and mercy by giving up ourselves to your service and cheerfully submitting in all things to your blessed will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <laughs> Morning, Lord Church. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Please stand as we sing together. This is the day.
And now we have the privilege of coming before the Lord in prayer. Please join me. Father, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for knowing the deep needs of our hearts. Those aches, those concerns that we have trouble even voicing. But you know them, Father. And we believe that you are working in our lives to bring the best solution for our needs. We trust that, Lord. So right now, we bring before you some of those concerns, the names of those that we have been praying for as we speak those names aloud. Thank you that you hear our names, Father. Thank you that we have the confidence of knowing that you are working your will out in their lives. Father, we thank you again for this community in which we live. We thank you for the friends that you've brought into our lives. The stories that we share of how we know that God brought us to this place at a particular time in our lives that we could not have imagined what you had planned for us. And so we thank you for that, Father. We trust that you will continue caring for us through the remainder of our days here. Father, we thank you for the leadership of our state, our nation, of the world. But we ask for your intercession. We ask for you to raise up godly leaders. We ask for you to intercede where evil prevails. We ask you for healing of the war torn nations. We ask for your protection of, for those who have experienced natural calamities. That again, that you would bring good out of what we see as evil. Father, we ask your protection for those who serve us on our streets, in our hospitals, and spots all around the world to assure our freedom and our health and our safety. Put a ring of protection around them, Father. Bless them for the sacrifice they make for us. And the Lord, because we sometimes do not know how to pray, we thank you that you gave us through your Son the prayer that he shared with his disciples as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
together. Send the light.
The tempter came to him and said, if you ask, Christ going on. I, I can speak up to you. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The him and said, Tell me the stones to be bread. We're going to start again. Then Jesus led the Spirit into the wilderness, led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell me stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. You will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. And the title of the day's message is The Importance of Knowing who You Are. And it's a sermon addressing temptation, obviously. You can come to that conclusion. So this morning, the Gospel lesson takes place after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And we are told that Jesus was baptized, he immediately came out of the water. Heaven opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting on him. The voice from heaven said, this is my son, who, son, who I dearly love, my happiness in him. And this is the core of Jesus' identity. Jesus is God's son, and baptism makes a new beginning. In Jesus' case, it was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, so that what goes, what does it mean to be God's son? <laughs> Just me. <laughs> Not lately. <laughs> <laughs> Did you cut that out of the recording, by the way? Sure. <laughs> okay, let's try it now. How are we doing? Oh, okay. how's that? Can you hear that? Turn off the microphone. There you go. Thank you, Brady. Sure. That's good because, you know, I like to move around a bit, right? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay, that's good, right? Now. Baptism marks in Jesus' case. Can you hear me? Yes. Use the microphone. In Jesus' case, it was the beginning of 
Jesus' earthly ministry. So what does it mean to be God's son? Who God dearly loves, in whom God finds happiness. And what does it mean for Jesus? What does it mean for us? Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and how Jesus responds to these temptations give us some very important clues as to who God is when God takes on flesh and becomes fully human. And for those of us who profess to follow Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior, our identity is extremely contingent on Jesus' identity. So who are we? What does it mean that you are a Christian and that I am a Christian? After all, the word Christian literally means little Christ, little Christs. How will we live into this identity? As Christians, who are we really? These are questions we ask when we are faced with difficult choices. There can be no, 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 no doubt that our identity is challenged the most when life is hard. What do you do when the rubber meets the road? Do you put your money where your mouth is? Do I? Where are we when everything else is stripped away? We are told that Jesus was famished when he was tempted by the devil. The text says literally after Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. We find ourselves faced with temptation when we are stressed too, when we're overtired and anxious or sick. It was in the wilderness that the Israelites struggled to identify themselves as people of God. And when the going got tough, they created a golden calf to worship in the place of God. And we are tested when we face financial problems or disagreements or threats. These are the kind of situations in which it is hardest for us to be the people God has called us to be. Notice that the first two of Jesus' temptation challenged the issue of his identity directly. The tempter came to him and said, since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. That's a huge temptation for someone who is not eating a thing for 40 days and 40 nights. So just how human is the Son of God willing to be? Will he indeed experience all kinds of suffering we experience? Will he use his power for his own personal needs? Will Jesus misuse his power for personal gain? Jesus late, last, later miraculously feeds others. But here in the wilderness, Jesus does not choose to feed himself in the same way. Jesus decides to escape human pain and suffering, but instead to be more than fully one of us. It is written, people won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. Jesus identifies himself with us. He does in this situation what he asks of us. Rather than using his power for his own person, uh, purposes, Jesus humbly humbles himself and trusts God the Father to satisfy his needs. And so here we see the Son of God is one who puts the needs of others above his own. You see, he came to serve, not serve himself. And as Christians, we are called to the same identity. Our lives are not to be about me or me, me, and mine, mine, and mine. Instead, they are to be about what can I do to help my neighbor? What can I do to better serve God? And when we ask ourselves these kind of questions, when the going gets rough, and it will, we will find that God provides the answers in God's word. But we don't live by bread alone, by, by every word spoken by God. 
In verse 5, we are told, after that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood him on the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down, for it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. This test focuses on Jesus' vulnerability and need for safety. The devil is inviting Jesus to make himself immune from injury and death. The devil even quotes scripture in order to try and prove that God agrees with him. But Jesus is not deceived. Jesus will not misuse his power in order to make himself safe and secure. And so while Jesus is hanging, hanging on the cross, we hear a near verbatim reputation of the devil's words by those who pass by Jesus and make fun of him. Oh, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Yeah, well, he's the king of Israel, so let him come down from the cross now. Then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. So let God deliver him now if he wants to. But he said, I am God's son. And by mocking Jesus and tempting Jesus, they are putting God to the test, just like the devil did, the devil did in the wilderness. But Jesus renounces all of these temptations. And in doing so, he is making his identity very clear. He fulfills the scriptures. As God's true son, by humbly obeying God's will, as we are told in Matthew 26, 54. Jesus replied, again, it is written, don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. You see, the devil is crafty. Sin is alluring. And we can easily make excuses for why it is okay to give in to this or that temptation. In the third temptation, Jesus must decide who he will serve. Will he serve God or will he serve evil? He must decide how he will use his authority. Will he choose a life of power or will he choose the life of a servant? Just who is this son of God going to be? And then later in Matthew chapter 16, we find a situation that is very similar. Jesus was asked, has asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ and the son of the living God. But then Jesus tells the disciples what this means. That he will have to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests and the legal experts. And that he will have to be killed and raised on the third day. Peter argues with Jesus about what it means to be the Son of God. He says that Jesus is wrong about his identity. He tells Jesus that as the Son of God, he should not suffer through the crucifixion and death. And so what does Jesus say? You see, he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stone that could make me stumble. For you are not thinking of God's thoughts, but the human thoughts. And so throughout his ministry, all the way to the death on the cross, Jesus defined, he identified that it, what it means to be the Son of God. 
And so as followers of Jesus, we must decline and identify what it means to be a child of God. Who are you going to be? Most of us cannot imagine the devil tempting us with bread up to 40 days fast. We don't know the fear of being held over the bed of the tallest building. And we certainly don't know the temptation of being offered all the power in the world. But we do understand pride and vanity and selfishness and passion. And it could be argued that these temptations are nearly as dark as Jesus' temptations, because most of the time our temptations don't come with a face. Temptation comes to us in moments when we look at others and feel insecure, seem secure about not having enough. <laughs> Repeat that again. Temptation comes to us in moments when we look at others and feel insecure about not having enough. Temptation comes to us in judgments we make about strangers or friends who do things we don't understand. See, temptation rules us, makes us able to live away from those in need. And to live our lives without a care in the world about the poverty and the disease and the hunger of others. Temptation rages in moments when we allow the devil to define our lives or when our addiction to wealth and power influence over others. Vanity or a need to control defines who we are. You see, temptation wins when we justify invisible lives. Small sins, a racist joke or two, a questionable business practice and criticism of a spouse or a friend when he or she is not around. Temptation wins when we get so caught up in the trappings of life that we lose sight of life itself. And through his temptation, Jesus shows us that, that we choose who or whose we will be. Just like Jesus, we will be hungry. We will have times when we are tempted to doubt God's faithfulness. We will be tempted to reach for power rather than to live the life of a servant. To live as children of God, we must serve God even when circumstances are difficult and hard. And this is when we really choose what it means to be a child of God. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, do this and do that. If we are the children of God, who will we be? What will we do? Okay. Mr. Mr. Moses, right? Thank you, Pastor. Your son, I can only imagine. 
My eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Oh, 